Hi, uh, welcome to the wonderful, awesome CBT Nuggets live chat with our trainers. My name is Ryan, I'm with CBT Nuggets, and I'm going to be the moderator for this great session. Um, many of you have sent in great questions that we're going to get to here in a few moments, but please know, of course, it's live, so we've got the live Twitter chat feeds going, so any questions that you have during the broadcast, we'll make sure and get a hold of, get those going, and get excited. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn it over to the trainers, have them tell you a little bit about themselves and what they're working on, and then we'll get to the questions. I'll start with Mr. Keith Barker. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Keith Barker. I am currently working on a penetration testing toolkit. It used to be called Backtrack, and the new name for it is Kali Linux. But effectively, all the tools are the same. So uh, if you want to learn how to uh, ethically hack and do verification of your network that is secure with authorization, that's the series for you. So I'm having a blast, and it's about halfway through. We have like 25 videos done, and we're going to get up for 40. It's going to be a an awesome, awesome, it is already an awesome tool set. So that's and, what I'm working on. And for any subscribers, you can see it live right now. Yeah, so, there's no waiting. Yep, no waiting at all. Tim? Hey, everybody. My name is Tim Warner, and I'm currently working on the Microsoft Exam 7412. It's one of the Windows Server 2012 titles. It's called Configuring Advanced Server Services. So I'm about halfway through and very jazzed. It's fun to do, and I hope you enjoy it, too. And I'm James Conrad from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm, uh, I usually do the Windows titles, a lot of the Windows titles. I just finished the 70-410 Server 2012, as well as the 70-411 for Server 2012. I'm currently working on the Windows 8 configuring title, which is 70-687. I think I got the numbers right. I think you did. <laughs> cool. Hey, everyone. Chris Ward here. Hey, howdy, hey. How are things going? Working on the uh, Microsoft OneNote 2010 and also uh, just kicking off uh, here in a little bit the Google Docs and getting some exciting stuff for that. Oh. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> hey, I'm Steve Casely working on update to the PMP, Project Management Professional Series. Uh, PMI issued the new release of the PMBOK <laughs> guide in January. So we're working at getting the new materials out there so it's fresh and ready for you when the exam cuts over at the end of August, 1st of September. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Right. Hey, everyone. Garth Schulte. Currently working on the Microsoft Exam 70-463, which is Data Warehousing in SQL Server 2012. So big data. A lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Nice. Excellent. And like we mentioned, um, thanks to uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, we've got a lot of great questions already submitted to us. So we're going to dive right in on those. And actually, the first question is a three-part question, believe it or not, <laughs> directed right at Mr. Chris Ward. Oh, so this great. Came, this came from Calvin, uh, one of our Facebook fans. And the first thing he asked is, what's some advice for becoming a better instructor that you would like to give us? Sure. Mr. Ward? Uh, oh, wait, can I take notes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, you know, Keith, Keith kind of leads into what I would say is that uh, learn from those that you respect and uh, appreciate. Uh, most of us, I think all of us, have taken an instructor-led training class or we have teachers. Uh, maybe you had that favorite teacher in high school or, or junior high that really got you excited about learning. And you, you start thinking about what was it that made them engaging? What made them make me excited about whatever the content was? And you try to capture some of that. Um, another su suggestion I always make is uh, steal frequently, borrow as much as possible. Uh, you know, Keith, Keith Barker here was uh, one of my inspirations is uh, becoming an online instructor uh, and learned a lot um, and uh, always was uh, more than willing to help me out and say, hey, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And so learn from people is probably the number one thing I could say for any instructor and never, ever think that you've made it. Uh, you know, that's the problem. I've encountered people that were considered top instructors and I sat in their class and I was thinking, you know what, I don't think they've changed a single thing since 1987. And, you know, that's not a good thing. So you want to make sure that you constantly are learning, find people that you respect and that you learn from and, and uh, use that. So that's the fir first question, right? Yeah, that's the first question. And I guess going into that, um, he, he dove a little deeper and wanted to know, you have such great knowledge and you have such great real world experiences. How do you do a blend of kind of putting those into the curriculum as you teach? You know, what would you say is your best practices around that? You know, it, it's funny. I think for every single person, um, if you ask any one of these guys, uh, the way that we perceive our experiences, the way that we see things, uh, definitely changes the way that we're going to we're going to say something um, you know something that uh, you know Tim will say in one of his series 
I'll say, you know, oh, wow, that's a great analogy. Um, but say, I didn't really experience it like Tim did. So what I'll do is I'll kind of look at my own life and say, okay, well, how can I take this knowledge of uh, whether it's how to use a pivot table or whether it's how to, you know, take the charts and graphs in PowerPoint and, and create something that looks visually stimulating. Um, how can I relate that to something that means something to me? Um, every instructor, I think, is going to be different because if I try to use uh, Tim's exact example, I have no idea what it what it was like, uh, or Keith's, or, or Garth's. So I always say, you know, take what you know, take whatever the content is, and uh, if you need to kind of sit on it and stew on it for a little bit and think it through, and the best thing to do is uh, literally, you know, pick up the phone, you know, I'll call James go, what do you think about this? And uh, James go, yeah, you know, thumbs up, or nah, I don't know if that's going to work real well. If you don't have a trainer to yeah. call, for example. If you don't have a trainer, talk, um, find friends. Yeah, f friends, people who know you really well. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, obviously being married, it really helps me because my wife knows me probably better than anybody, and I'm able to say, what do you think? And she knows right away whether I'm pushing too hard on trying to make something work or whether I haven't really thought it through, and, um, especially her being, you know, she's semi-technical, so I use her as a great sounding board going, have I explained this satisfactorily to you that you can now repeat it back to me? And, and I go, yep, you got it. Or, mm, okay, let's rework this a little bit. Uh, so, and then do you give her a quiz at the end? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you have to be careful with this spouse. Uh, I will admit that. So, uh, but I think that the, to translate knowledge into curriculum, though, which is also something that needs to be uh, repeatable, um, it might work for one group of people, but you want to try to balance balance it out a little bit. At least that's from my experience. Sure, I think that's great advice. And I think the the third part of that question is when you go to make a nugget or a series for that example, right. what type of planning and preparation do you put in? Let's just let's just do one nugget for an example. Okay. How much planning goes into making one thirty minute video? Uh, the the thing that always comes up with that is that you know I'm a I'm a, I call them a three pointer. I want three points, you know. I'm I'm always about the three P's, the three R's, and you know, three point, and and then let everyone go. So that's how I do it. Every, some people are different. So what I do is I look at the content. I know that I've got 20 to 30 minutes to take a look at something, and so I break it down. The nice thing about 30 minutes is that's 10 minutes a point. Sure. Um, and then of course, if you're like, well, can I talk for 10 minutes about uh, how to draw a square on a Word document? Probably not, but can I start talking about drawing many different objects and grouping those objects together? Ah, okay, that's my 10-minute thing. Okay. It's now, instead of just draw a square, it's now drawing and sorting objects. So I'll build and I'll say, how long can I take to talk about something? And sometimes that's just a little bit of practice where I'll literally, I'll fire up my you know computer, I'll start talking, get my headset on and start doing a CBT nugget and go back and listen to it and go, wow, I just spent 10 minutes talking about nothing. I need to re, re I need to redo that. And so I start from the basically and Steve will appreciate this from a work package level, the small level, oh, and I and it comes into play a little there bit. There you go, there you go, a little project management there. Start at the work package level, roll it up to a parent account, and then uh, hey, how much time is that? Oh, okay, now we're at about 10 minute mark. Okay, I've done my bullet number one. What's bullet number two? And then uh, a secret I learned from uh, a mutual friend of uh, Keith and I's, uh, Doug Bassett, is called the problem solution. Okay, now I solved this problem. That created a solution. Well, now this solution, what does that create? It might create another problem. Okay, well, now that I know how to do this, how do I do that? And so that's how you can create, especially in curriculum, is the transitions. Uh, uh, Keith and uh, several other instructors I work with are fond of saying that, hey, training is a journey. Know where you're coming from, know where you're going, and as long as you know those two things, you're going to be good all the way through it. That's awesome. Um, and again, just a quick reminder, we are live, so if you have questions, whether it's on Facebook, Google+, Plus, Twitter, please make sure and uh, chat it in, and we'll make sure and get to those. Um, but we're going to move over to uh, Mr. Keith Barker. Keith, let's get that water in there. Don't get it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, we had a Google Plus user um, ask the question, to be a cybersecurity expert, what is the level of network knowledge needed is the first question. Gotcha. That's a great question. So um, if we were going to verify the uh, security of, a, let's say, a, a glass bubble, we would need to know everything about glass bubbles. So to be a, a penetration tester and a security expert for computer network, we have to understand basically how everything works. So the OSI reference model is a conceptual framework 
how different vendors, operating systems, and network devices like Juniper, HP, Cisco, Palo Alto, et cetera, how they all fit into that. See, that, you really need to know all that. Uh, okay, then above and beyond that, we also need to know what the vulnerabilities are for those protocols. Uh, one of the biggest things that I learned the hard way was that Linux, you need to learn Linux. So there's no easy way to say that other than jump in and enjoy it. So what I did, I started creating the Backtrack series. I worked with Linux back in the 90s. And uh, so I thought, oh, I know Linux, okay. I started doing Backtrack, and I, I found myself at the command line interface saying, what was that again? Was it Locate? Was it LS? Was it PWD? What? So I actually took Sean Powers' Linux courses, which are awesome, by the way, and just to get myself ramped up for the basics so I could start focusing on the actual tools. So I would say you have to know the basics of the network. You have to understand how it works, and then you have to understand the vulnerabilities. And the deal is, just like everybody would say, you have to keep on top of it because every day there's a new vulnerability that's released. There's a new exploit that takes advantage of that vulnerability. And as a security professional, if, we're, if our job is to build the best found, you know, fortress of security for our network, it's a never-ending process. So, kind of, did I answer that question? I, I think you definitely did. Okay. Um, but I think dovetailing a little bit deeper into that is around. I heard you talk Juniper. I heard you talk Cisco. Right. I heard you start talking about Backtrack. I heard you talk about Linux. So his next part of that question was with the different certs out there, the different courses out there. Right. So we know we've got our foundation. We need to know about Linux now in this world, right? So yep. LPIC one, LPIC two, having that baseline. How far within the Cisco and Juniper, for example, okay. how far in those tracks? I mean, are you going to the CCIE level? Can you be okay at CCMP? How does that fit? Great question. I would say that uh, definitely you don't need to be a CCIE to do really effective knowledge of Cisco networks. And in reality, you don't need any type of certification for Cisco. If you've really studied it and learned it, you're good. Um, the key is to really understand it. So as far as if we had to quantify that with certification for Cisco, it would be the professional level. So CCMP, routing and switching. Um, unfortunately, not unfortunately, voice is huge too. There's such a, um, an opportunity to, to hack that. I mean, you could jump in a network, do a man in the middle attack, catch your entire stream, play it back and know exactly what you talked about, both sides. You know, and you're, it's like three clicks to do that. So understanding how the voice works, how calls are set up, also wireless is a huge uh, vector. So in reality, uh, if someone was a CCNP level at voice, at wireless and route switch, that would put them in good shape. Okay. And the CCNP security is also a good thing. That really focuses on how to implement mitigation okay. on the Cisco side. Okay. And Juniper has their quick one as well. Perfect. And I think we all know in the world, as you mentioned, things are always changing. Yeah. So as new technologies come out, as you mentioned about that new series, Backtracks now just become you know one level deeper and things like that. So it's staying up on that stuff to make sure that you're staying focused. Yeah, and then new protocols too. It's like sure. if you have this big fortress of security for IP version 4, and then Six. IPv6, it's enabled by default. It's like, so if you get a machine on that network, and you can own all these devices using IPv6, which is running, they all have link local addresses, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. It's fun. It's a, it's a fun ride, and uh, anybody who is in, in, interested in that, I strongly recommend you pursue it. It's, there's going to be a huge need for penetration testers and people to understand networks. It's not, they say that computers are catching on networks. I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, some I, I would say uh, everybody really? goes, yeah, yeah. someone. Yeah, so yeah, I, I've loved every step of the way, and we put that all of us put that in our videos. So we want to share those experiences and that knowledge, so you can you know learn and conquer in your own environment using the knowledge that we have to share with you. Awesome, thanks, Keith. You bet. Uh, next question comes from another Facebook user, uh, Tarek, and James swims for you. Uh, his first question is: Do you feel that Windows Server training is enough to be um, an IT professional? Well, that's really a loaded question uh, <clears throat> because. Is Windows Server training enough to be an IT professional? It depends on, first of all, if you already have a job in IT. Um, if, you're a, if you're a help desk person in IT right now and you learn server training, it's very useful because that can help you to advance and to move, hopefully, and maybe into a different department unless you like help desk, uh, help desk work. Uh, normally, when you go into server topics, you're going to be able to increase your marketability and your value to a company. Um, so. I think you can't go wrong with with more server knowledge because it runs so many services, so many things depend on it. Um, all your use, your whole user directory is there. I mean, it's kind of this the focal point for everything that happens uh, within your organization. So definitely, you have to have server. I think. Okay. Uh, unless you want to go like the, to the dark side, like where Keith is, and and you just want to do networking stuff, and you don't know how to use a mouse or a keyboard, you just you just do Cisco things. That's all. 
<laughs> Diving into Super 2012, I think a lot of us have had the opportunity to read and you know obviously see our series. You know, automation um, is a big thing, and one of the things that someone asked is, you know, how do you see the future of the cloud, and how do you see since Microsoft Server, I think, for this push compared to 2008, has really looked at making it less dependent on going to that terminal and having that opportunity to do more things from one particular machine, whether it's using cloud technology or not, depending on. But I guess his question is kind of about, as we see Windows now getting on board with that and, mm -hmm. and being more focused with the automation side, mm -hmm. what do you look at when you see the, the future of the cloud, the private yeah. cloud, the public? What, what's yeah. kind of your take on that? Well, the cloud is definitely uh, where everything's going. And uh, I would, first of all, I have to admit that I'm not the expert in the cloud. Uh, but I do know that that's where things are going, and I would strongly recommend that you get uh, sharp on wherever you can for that. I know we do use uh, Amazon Web Services for a lot of things that we do, and uh, there's a lot of other solutions out there. I use cloud storage for a lot of the things that I have. So, uh, again, it's a little bit of a broad question, but I remember, remember a few years ago, uh, we were talking about this with Keith uh, well, yesterday, I think, uh, when we used to do seminars and things, we didn't have virtual machines. We had three separate laptops, and we had to, to show things separately on each individual laptop. Uh, and then virtualization came along and blew everybody's mind. You know, and once it got working well, that's what everybody uses now. You know, Hyper-V, VMware, what have you. The cloud is that next great thing uh, in terms of storage, even in terms of servers. A lot of organizations don't even have their own servers in-house anymore. They're using Amazon's, you know, solution and everything, or somebody else's. Right. And uh, so all of that processing, they don't even have their own server room, or at least not as big of a server room, uh, because of the cloud. So, so what's your thoughts on that, based on some of the stuff you've done? Um... Mm -hmm. The question, I, I saw it as two threads or two parts. One, Windows Server 2012 multi-server administration. Certainly there's an emphasis on using Windows PowerShell to administer the server with PowerShell remoting, with the server manager console. The emphasis is, for instance, to sit at your administrative workstation and be able to touch any servers in your environment. So that's certainly a big important feature of Windows Server 2012. Uh, in terms of cloud computing specifically, um, Garth, you'd have a lot to say about that too, having migrated your organization to the cloud. But what I'll say briefly is, I mean, it makes a heck of a lot of sense for a business. I mean, just think of power consumption. A rack of servers sucks mm -hmm. up quite a bit mm -hmm. of power. Wouldn't it be nice to have another company paying those utility bills? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how about backups and what a pain those can be? Wouldn't it be nice to trust another company? But I think at the same time, trust is probably the biggest um, side of the double-edged sword. Sure. Do you trust your hosting provider with confidential um, data, intellectual property? Garth, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I mean, it, from a developer standpoint, too, it makes it a lot easier because now we don't have to worry about all the, the, the management side. It's all managed for us. And I'll speak of that when we get to our question. Okay, because perfect. Because cloud computing is big in development. It is. Uh, I want to get to one quick question, and we really appreciate everyone tweeting in. We're getting some of those great messages. Uh, James, since we were just on that, we had a question come in. Our domain name is not conventional. Should we look into changing that before we install Exchange Server? Well, the, the, the domain name is not conventional. Is that what they said? Yes. Um, and I, I don't know exactly what they mean by that, but unless they're saying that it's not a non, it's a non-public, like it ends in private or not local or something like that, um, you don't have to change that before you go to Exchange. There's probably other people that know Exchange here better than I do, uh, but. Uh, I would say, you know, you don't have to change that because there's there's ways of being able to keep your existing domain name and still have mail routed to your Exchange server, even though it's got a different domain. Uh, so that that's there's all different methods for for doing that kind of a thing. Um, plus, a domain rename is can be highly disruptive. Uh, it's supposed to be smoothed out the way Microsoft has done things. You can change. I don't know if their domain is. A public domain, or if their domain is an Active Directory domain that they currently have, um, I guess since it's non-conventional, it'd have to be private. But anyway, um, but when you change it, it does dis disrupt your service, or at least for a period of time, and uh, you really have to map that out carefully and whiteboard it and have lots of meetings and things to make sure that that goes smoothly. Okay. Same so, I don't know if that answers the question. I think, I think that there. Yeah, that makes sense. It reminds me of a field story. I uh, worked at a shop. Fortunately, I came in after this happened, but 
when my colleague had designed their Active Directory domain, because they were using an internal DNS structure, he chose the name school.local. He figured, you know, it's a non-routable DNS name, we're cool. But it was a school that was mixed environment, Windows and Mac. And Max yeah. with their Bonjour protocol yeah. used yeah. dot local. Right. <laughs> so we basically had he had to scrap the the domain and rebuild it using we used dot lan eventually. Yeah, there's also a I had some discussion with this with an, one of our viewers uh, a while back. I can't remember all the details, but uh, dot local used to be something we can always use internally. And apart from the Bonjour issue, uh, which I've also run into by the way. Uh, apart from that, there's also uh, other domain naming standards out there now that are now accepting .local as a public space. Oh, gotcha. So that really complicates things as well. So. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, great. And uh, please keep those questions coming. Um, Steve, we're going to go ahead and turn over to you and talk a little project management uh, from uh, Fatty from Facebook. He asked, what is uh, better for the IT field? A little, uh, little question here. Uh, PMP or PRINCE2? That is a really hard question <laughs> yeah. to answer. It's a loaded because question. <laughs> it's it's a loaded question. <laughs> but they're both excellent uh, project management disciplines. Um, they each have their strengths, uh, I'll, and I'll be honest, they each have their weaknesses. They're both set to be generic project management principles, so you can apply PMI, PMP, or, or PRINCE2, whichever one you're at, for IT, which is obviously the focus most people here are, we're all IT people, sure. but you can use it for building bridges, you can use it for anything. They, they, they follow the same basic principles. So they're both generic. So saying one has more IT bend to it than the other, I don't think they really do. A lot of it, I'm, and I'm not trying to cop out on the answer, I think a lot of it will, will go back to the geography. Where are you doing business? My experience is, exactly, as you said, Ryan, if you're in Europe, the Prince 2 has far more public public support. It's recognized by more businesses. So again, if you're in Europe, if you're in Asia, if you're in Australia, my experience is the Prince 2 is the more respected simply because it has more history. In North America, which is where we are, the PMI PMP seems to have a higher recognition. So again, without trying to copy it and saying they're equal, they are equal, a lot of it is going to go back to, to simply where you're doing business. You know, here in, in, in the U.S., it's, it's almost becoming a requirement to have your PMP to work with the federal government. There are more and more organizations saying, if you want to be a project manager in North America, prove it. Show me your PMP. There are places in Europe saying the same thing, except they're saying, show me your Prince 2 certification. So they're both excellent. Find the one that's going to satisfy your location, your organizational needs, and focus on that one. You can't and go I, wrong with either. And I would also I would also add on to it just you know from my perspective and, and experience is that Asia Pack is now moving more towards the PMI side of things. Okay. Uh, just for an example, a, a good friend of mine you know, went to uh, Beijing when the Olympics. Uh, was there, and they were the Chinese government wanted sixty five thousand PMPs trained to help them with their project management of the building in freeway infrastructure, building the stadiums. Yep. And what you notice was it was a huge success for China. Roll back a few years before to the previous Summer Olympics in Greece, where literally people were coming into the stadium and the paint was drying on the seats. And they had used uh, other other project management methodologies, and uh, so there, there's there's definitely, I think, a from a global standpoint, PMI yeah. seems to be gaining traction. In internationally, total headcount, PMI, right. PMP certainly has it. But he's definitely right. If you're in uh, England, uh, Western Europe especially, uh, Prince 2 reigns. Yeah. That's, where, that's what you want to have. Right. And I think it's also interesting, too, is um, you define IT, but then we think IT plus development. You know, then we start talking agile, right? And we've got Absolutely. Scrum there. And, yep. and so I think, to, to both of your points, not only is it based on geography, but I think it's also based on what's best within inside your organization. And Absolutely. So and that, that throws one more twist. You, you said the Agile, the Scrum. So again, yeah. is, is the PMI, PMP, or Prince the way to go? Are you what I would call a more traditional shop? Or are you going into the iterative, and to use the word Agile approach, then a Scrum or an Agile certification is going to be more for you, yeah. or, or some hybrid between the two. Unfortunately, there isn't a single right answer. It's like everything else, you know? <laughs> What's the better development language? Well, yes. There's six, seven of us around the table. There are seven best development languages. It, it's almost the same with, with project management as well. Sure. No, I, I hear you there. Um, and I think 
kind of upon that too, another question came in around the certif certification side of things with project management. And I think it's interesting, as we just talked about that, obviously um, PMI now is certified in Agile. Yes. Uh, but, you know, Scrum, is, you've got your Scrum Master. Where do you think the future of certifications is going within the project management slash IT field? I wish I had that crystal ball. I, I really do. Yeah. Um, I think the, the the trend is certainly more towards the, the agile um, iterative approaches, and I think that's evident by the fact that the PMI is now on the agile bandwagon. Sure. You know, I don't think uh, PMI has still fully addressed it. You know, reading about the new new PMBOK guide, which is what I'm working on my new series right. of. Uh, the, the biggest criticism I've seen so far today, I don't know if you've seen, Chris, yeah. is the word agile has appeared like six times. Somebody did a, a, a search on it, and although PMI is embracing agile, it's still not in the, the core. But I think generally businesses are moving more towards the agile approaches. And, right? and I think what, and this is just PMI, I think in general, I can only speak for myself and my anal you know, analysis of it, you know, I don't speak for PMI, but you'll notice that they are starting to recognize the need for starting people in the generic sense. In other words, a broad overview, which is what the PMP does. Uh, or if you don't have enough experience, the uh, CAPM, you know, the certified associate. And then once you're in that realm is when you start seeing PMI now beginning specialization. Exactly. PMI scheduling professional, PMI risk practitioner. Those are now uh, becoming hot new topics. Agile has now been added. Um, you know, Steve was probably in on this. Uh, as a PMP, as a PMP, they sent out, PMI sent out this huge survey going, which type of agile format are you going, yeah. would you vote for? Um, more scrum kind of, or, you know, and yeah. so, and basically, the new Agile stuff has come out of most of the it, PMPs responding. Exactly. The, the, the new Agile, the PMI ACP, is, is th they actually have a, a, a suggested reading list at the beginning of, of the, the PMI ACP, and they list basically every one of the disciplines. You're going to read the Scrum. You're going to read the Agile. You're going to read the Extreme Program. You're going to read the DSDM. So if, if there's any one area that, that is still very much fluid, it's that whole Agile approach. And Scrum much like PMI seems to have the, the thought leadership in traditional, yeah. the word scrum has the thought leadership in the agile approaches. So, you know, probably the safest bet is PMI, PMP if you're traditional, or scrum if you're, you're in, into the, the iterative, but it's, it's not settled yet. Okay. There's still some wars to be fought. Awesome. <laughs> I want to get back to a few questions that were getting live tweeted in, and uh, Keith, this one is for you. Okay. Is CCIE in route switch <laughs> essentially essential? Excuse me, for those who are planning to get their CCIE in security. Uh, great question. Um, so I've got a couple. I've got one of those each, and I would. <laughs> I failed my uh, CCI security first time I took it, and here's why. I walked in, and back in 2003 for my second CCIE, I thought, oh, I'm a CCIE. I just go back to Chris says like you're never done right. Uh, let's see, uh, don't ever think you've arrived. I wrote that down. Um, so I fail it because it tested a lot of basic routing and switching and BGP, which I wasn't expecting again in the security. I thought oh, I'll throw some IP sec tunnels in. It'll be great. And it was it was like that plus a whole bunch of BGP and advanced routing and switching. So I would say definitely it does help to have a route switch CCI before your security, but not required. Uh, the blueprint's all out there. You can go study. Just make sure you're ready for every item on that blueprint. And um, I would just say one. My coaching is take one at a time. Yeah. And for a person out there who's interested in getting multiple, I would say get the route switch first, and then get your security. If you think I'm only going to do one, and that's it, and it wants to be security, you can definitely do that without the route switch. Okay. And dovetailing into that, um, what would you? What's your take on backtrack certifications? And would you suggest getting that? <laughs> so, um, certified ethical hacker has they've got a I think a great course on that. Great um, course. Great you can get certified yeah. uh, as a certified ethical hacker. Backtrack does not has a 300 plus tools in it. Now they just as of March 13th last week they released a new version of Backtrack called Backtrack Not Five, not Backtrack Six either. No, no, no. They're calling it Cali Linux. But I, uh, last night, so I downloaded it all. Tool for tool, all the tools are there. So we're going to call that title Backtrack slash Cali Linux. And everything that is in that is applies. So um, for being a pen tester, a penetration tester, I, I wouldn't think you'd need to, uh, 
technically to have a certification in it, okay. as long as you practice, you know what you're doing. But I think a lot of companies are not going to hand over the keys and say, here, you are authorized to do this, 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 no root kits, no physical access, whatever, unless you do have some credentials. And I think the certified ethical hacker is one of those that would be a starting point for those credentials. Okay, perfect. Excellent, thank you. Well, please keep these uh, coming in. We'll be sure to get them as soon as we can. Uh, but we definitely want to turn it over to Mr. Garth. Hey, it's yeah. good to have you here, man. Thanks. Um, and I don't know if very many people know, but Garth is actually the longest running trainer here at CBT Nuggets. Yeah. He's been here for many years, so uh, we're, we're thrilled to have him. But it's his first time out here to Oregon, yeah, so we're really no excited problem. to have him out here. Um, but uh, first question that comes in for you, and I know this is near and dear to your heart, um, what do you think the future of .NET is? I think it's cross-platform development. Okay. Nobody wants to build an application multiple times that target multiple platforms, or even develop it once and import it to multiple platforms. They want to build it once and target many platforms and many devices. And uh, in the future, that's mono. Mono is a cross-platform development. It's basically .NET for non-Windows devices. Okay. Cool. So we can build it once and target all these non-Windows devices. And, and Mono Touch is for Apple products, iOS. Okay. Um, so that's really where I think the future is going to go. Okay. What do you think about some of the new startups and stuff? I'd love to get your thoughts just on Node. You know, Node is kind of Node.js is kind of the big buzzword that we've heard a lot of people talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I honestly haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but okay. I hear many good things, and I'm excited to get into it as well. Okay, it's cool. Be part of my future training. We, yeah, we know kind of client <laughs> side and some of the different stuff. Um, with the flexibility and some of the different things that you're seeing, though, do you feel like .NET's moving to that cross-platform quick enough? Uh, Mono's been around for a long time, so quick enough? No, and C Sharp's been around for a long time, but it seems like the the, the need for it is going to drive us there a lot faster than than it has in the last you know ten years. Gotcha. When you look at languages, and I think we all kind of talked about that, can you kind of give us a little bit of um, just watch C Sharp? What, what is it about C Sharp that really grabs people with that .NET platform? Well, it, it's it's elegant, it's uh, easy, it's familiar, and uh, and and once you get the hang of it, it's 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 fast. You can write it and get things done uh, quickly. Uh, and and the big thing about C Sharp is right now it, it can hit two billion devices. So C Sharp plus Mono equals. World Anything, domination. Anywhere. World <laughs> <Yeah>. domination. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you. Well, I'm going to go back to a couple of few Twitter questions, and we'll get some, to some other ones. But um, to the Microsoft uh, people in the house, a um, couple questions. First is, will the need for traditional MCEs diminish over time? What's your guys' take on that? MCEs? MCSE, I'm sorry. MCSEs, yeah. Um, no, I think it's... Yeah, there's always a running debate on that. Do you need a, cert a certificate to advance in your job? A lot of people that say, no, you don't, are those who rose up through the ranks of the company on their own without ever getting a certificate. So they say, why would I have ever needed a certificate? Because look where I am now. Um, on the other hand, people are trying to break into the field. The certificate is much more valuable for them because they're not already entrenched in a company. They already have some kind of seniority or whatever uh, to move on through as well or, or that, that hands-on experience. Um, so I think the value of the MCSC is increasing in value because uh, there's there's – the IT field as a whole is growing exponentially, and there is still great demand for IT professionals. And uh, I just think it's a great way to still get into a career, especially if you haven't had five, ten years of experience to put on your resume, and you need to get there. Also, um, you know, corporations can be pretty cold, <laughs> and you have a job today, but it may not be there next week. That's just how it is, and and the way things work. And uh, although the experience is good for you, it would never hurt to also have an MCSE, you know, in addition to the fact that you have seven years' experience at the company that just let you go. So, you know, I, I can't see where you'd go wrong in getting a certi certification. I'm going to plus, in there, too. Sorry. You know, go ahead, oh, good. Plus, uh, plus, the other part of it is, look, you're not just getting a certificate. You are learning the topics in that certificate. Right. Yeah. So, you're, so what I tell people is, even if you don't want this certification, Still look at the, still watch and learn from the whole videos because that's all stuff you're still going to need on the job anyway. Right. Just don't take the exam. Two yeah. word, two words: Active Directory. Okay, MCSE takes you through and really helps you to understand that. Mm -hmm. I mean, before with NT40, and then all of a sudden in the world of Windows 2000, I became an MCSE on 2000. World opened up. Okay, now I get it. And uh, having the right training. Helps you whether you get the certificate and take the test or not. It's the knowledge that you're yep. gaining. And I, I can't speak specific for the Microsoft certification, but with project management certification, it's it's what you said. There's some seasoned old dogs being one of them <laughs> out there in the field, and organizations are asking the seasoned old dogs to to get the certification mm -hmm. to to 
to validate their skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got 10 years experience. You've, you've done a good job. You've delivered projects successfully for us. But you need to prove to us you, you, you're delivering these projects yeah. successfully, not by good luck, but by good skill. Yeah. And how do you prove your skill? You prove your skill yeah. by the certification. Yeah. You know what I think the other thing is, uh, people are, prospective employers are a little skeptical, even if you've got this experience at the old company, yeah. because we well, you know how to do things their way using only their methods, but exactly. do you have a broad knowledge of how to also work with anybody else? Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. And yeah. because a lot of IT folks get pigeonholed into only working with user accounts and only with exchange accounts, and you know, but you ask them to, to configure a site properly, or, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, so there's a lot of other yep. things involved. With One thing too, and I go back to a topic that I maybe already know. I'm amazed that every time, without fail, I will pick up something new. Yeah. And I'll say, oh my gosh, so that's you know, here's the thing I knew for a year or two. That's how it really works. <laughs> life, life that awesome well. yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's it's a win win. Sure. To get, sure. You know, watch, learn, and then just. You know, own conquer, it. conquer. Watch, learn, conquer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a good line. Uh -oh. Did we just um, get some? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Thirty going, days. Going back into NCSC, um, Tim, this one's for you. Um, so, I'm considering focusing on messaging and server infrastructure. Would you say that is a solid combination, or would you say there's a better two-part combination that you would recommend? Mm. In general practice general advice, I would suggest that the individual focus on server infrastructure mm -hmm. principally, and then if they want to, start to specialize. To kind of tie this question into the previous one, I, I think personally, for what little opin my opinion's worth, I think Microsoft made a good decision bringing back the MCSC. Um, as some of you, I'm sure, know, and my colleagues know, the MCITP has had kind of a rocky life with many organizations and hiring managers and HR staff never getting the, the, the memo, so to speak. So it's good that that's back. Um, it's nice that Microsoft still offers some specialization, platform-specific specializations with the MCSE. So my short answer is yes, I think the speciali specialization is good, okay. but I would formally recommend focusing on server and then specializing. Mm -hmm. That's a great recommendation. Keith, uh, this is a good question. You'll like this. So when we say in networking, this packet is dropped, et cetera, et cetera. Right. My question is, where did it go? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. So we're going to do a visual here. Right? You want the whiteboard? No, we're going okay. to be devices. So okay. you're going to be a router, <laughs> switch. Router, switch, router, switch, and I'll be a router. Fair enough. So um, we'll have somebody send a packet into you at layer three of the OS server response. So the packet gets into you. Fantastic. So you receive the packet. <laughs> I have it. I love you it. De -encapsulate, you actually you receive a frame. Okay. It has your MAC address on it. You take that off. You re encapsulate it at layer two with his, I, his layer two address, and you forward it through the switch. Fantastic. You're a transparent switch. You know the MAC address is very quick for you. You forward it. Steve has it. Great. Steve has No. <laughs> uh, dropped. So he receives it. He sees that it's destined to his layer 2 MAC address. So he says, oh, it's for me. He de-encapsulates it, looks at the IP address, says, oh, it's not for me. But I know how to get there. I'm a router. So he re-encapsulates it. Layer 2 frame sends it over to you, James. Layer 2 switch, correct? Forwards yep. it to James. James says, hey, this is my layer 2 address. I'm interested. He de-encapsulates it, looks at the IP address, says, oh, it's not me, but I know how to forward it. He then re-encapsulates it with my layer 2 address, forwards it to the switch, who forwards it to me, and say, ah, oh, it's my layer 2 address. Boring yet? Repetition is a good thing to remember concepts. So I de-encapsulate it, and I say, oh, this is for IP address 23159. I don't know how to get there. Here's the answer to the question. Ready? <laughs> that packet is dead. I'm not going to forward it. That's a drop packet. So what I will do as a courtesy is I will say, you know what? Uh, this packet did come from this person over there. I will it send means a, a lot to me. I will send an ICMP <laughs> message indicating that I dropped your packet with information of why I dropped it. So I'll send that back. We can do the whole encapsulation thing back towards the source. And so he finally gets a message saying, oh, no, that packet's dead. Oh, I don't get it back. Not that one. Okay. It's over. But I will give you a message saying that why I dropped it. So that's what a drop packet is in the world of IP networking. Perfect. Um, Here's your cup. Thank you very much. It's been touched by a lot of people. All right. This one kind of for the whole group. I hope everyone's got some opinions on this. If you were opening up a data center, what would be the main certification that you would look for? Networking, Windows Server, Sysadmin, Network Engineer. What are some of the things that you would recommend if you were an individual saying, I'm opening up a data center? I would start yes. with project management. That's. Hey, <laughs> yeah, <I see. laughs> Let's make sure we have all our ducks in line yep. first.
So yes, and then the other thing would be honestly, Server Plus would be a big one. I mean, because that covers a lot of different. You've talked in terms of the hardware and what it's all capable of. I mean, you have to really be well versed in what things are capable of and what you need okay. in that data center and how to keep it all cool and all kinds of stuff. You know. All right. Can I, can I jump in there? So I don't know why you wouldn't. Cisco's, <laughs> it never stopped you before. <laughs> <laughs> so Cisco's got a CCNA data center that we're putting on the calendar to build. And that is, um, it is Cisco focused, but they've got some amazing products for our data center. So that's one that you might want to have, at least one of your technicians familiar with. Because it covers not just you know Cisco, UCS, it also covers the VMware portions and the IO and the storage area network, all the stuff that makes the data center possible. So it's a, it's a great entry level okay. to the world of data center. Very cool. If you're doing Cisco, if you're doing some other vendor, I would recommend that other vendors. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, for the SQL crowd, so um, let's see here. What certificate certificate would you recommend me begin with? I took a class in SQL, so I'm stuck. If I should start with SQL or Oracle Service? Anybody? Hmm. What do you have hmm. in your shop? Yeah, yeah, that's. Good. I, I yeah. guess that's a great question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what are you what are you going to use? Uh, to me, it seems, um, I mean, and it's funny because I'm not a DB, uh, but all the guys I know, they always get both, okay. the most of them. I mean, they're, they're going to go get Oracle because if they are in Squeal, you know, SQL, uh, they want to know what's happening. <laughs> they want to know what's happening. And sure. then the Oracle guys are like, you know, I'm going to encounter a SQL guy, and so I might as well get and know and understand the thing. So wherever you start with, I'd start with whatever I have in my shop, Okay. get that cert, and then start expanding as We've said you're never done. You're, you're never done. Keep, keep going. You know, keep moving it, forward, right? it actually depends on on you know your region too, because my path took me down the Microsoft trail. All the organizations in, in our area are generally Microsoft shops, so I, I, I've avoided Oracle for many years. <laughs> Simply because that's what your environment. Simply is. Because it's the environment. Sure, yeah. Yeah. that's a great point. Um, James, this one's for you, and I think this is an excellent question. Very timely. Do you recommend going for the seventy dash six forty seven enterprise admin two thousand eight? R2, if I'm an MCSA 2008, or would you just say go for 2012? Oh, wow. I would say uh, go for both and buy all the videos for both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, honestly, um, I would just leapfrog over that and go right to 2012. Because you might as well get four years further ahead in the technology. Um, it's hard to put a percentage on it, but I'd say maybe 80% of the stuff is the same anyway. Uh, there's some new things, of course, in Server 2012 that are nice and shiny. Um, anything you learn for 2012 mostly will still apply to 2008. So in terms of practical administration, you'll still be fine. Okay. Uh, I'd say go right for 2012. You would. Yeah. They still have users, I understand. No, that's right. They have users, <laughs> Active Directory, all that stuff. Kevin, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that as sure. well. Um, quite honestly, I, I look at IT certifications as an investment, too. So you want to get as much return on that investment as possible. I mean, let's face it. The Microsoft exams are over $100 USD yeah. per attempt. And then there's training investment. There's time investment. And ultimately, at the end of the process, you're going to have a Microsoft certification that will qualify you for a job. Whether that says Windows Server 2008 or 2012 may not make a difference. The point is, do you have the cert, and how long do you want or expect that the cert will be valid? So I, I agree with James. I'd suggest you go for Server 2012, if for no other reason that you're going to get more mileage out of your investment. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Uh, Keith, this is a follow-up question on that CCI route switch we asked. Mm -hmm. I came back in and said, would you recommend PGP? Um, QOS, CCMP, security search before attempting CCI route switch, since CCI route switch, kind of from what you said, covers those topics. Gotcha. Um, was it asking if the CCMP are a good building block? Yeah, choice? and the BGP, and kind of just, I think, some of those funda fundamental factors. I think, I think, yes, there's two approaches to getting certificates. One is, I just want the cert because I want it, so I'm going to cram and study and, and just get it done. But here's what I strongly recommend. If you're going to become a CCIE, why not? Because we're going to invest months of time practice and really learn the skills, right? Learn it. Don't just memorize something, learn it. So here's what I'd recommend. If you're at the beginning, start with CC, uh, Network Plus, then CCNA, and then there's CCNP. And, and here's the difference. As you go through each of those topics, don't just say, oh yeah, I understand the BGP selection path for the best route. Learn. Practice it. Lab it up. Make sure you can only understand it, but also troubleshoot if it goes wrong. And then as you build those skills, you're going to be head and shoulders above everybody else in that same category. 
So as you master the content, as you go through it, then when you go to CCIA, you can leverage that. It's like building a foundation and then putting the house on top of it. So in CCIA, when they ask you to do you know, MPLS, Layer 3 VPNs, and you'll say, oh yeah, I totally get those pieces. I understand the BGP. That's not a mystery. And you can actually put it together and test it. And here's the real deal. When you go to the service provider network, so the, where's the cloud, right? Guess what? The cloud is the stuff that we're building for other companies, right? So they've got the gear. They've got the data center. And somebody has to build that. So when a company asks you to come in their office and they say, we're switch communications in Las Vegas, Nevada, hypothetical. And here's this uh, two-hour lab for all of our candidates. We want you to do it. It's going to be BGP redistribution, some security, da, da, da. Not only will you be able to do it, you'll be able to do it in time and with confidence and say, yep, yeah, here you go. I've done the whole config. Any other questions? Which is very rare for somebody to be able to actually knock it out the park. Sure. So as you say, I would say CCMP is a great idea if you do it with the intent of learning as you go and mastering it as you go. And then when you get the CCI, learn it to learn it. There's no shortcuts there that I'm aware of for people passing. And then, and then you can turn around and take those skills and directly apply them to the real world, which is, you know what, that's when the, my, my life is just so happy. When I see students who watch, learn, master the material, and change their life. So whether it's quality of service in a network or quality of service in their own life, it's going to equate to a better opportunity for them. And I think to your point earlier that you mentioned, you took that first CCA, you didn't pass. Right. And that's okay. You know, you're not going to always get it the first time. I think yeah. it's one of those things that you can prepare and you can do the best you can. But uh, a great um, networking moment, moment yeah. is sometimes you fail to learn. And then when you go back in, you've obviously got a much better handle of what you're needing to prepare for. Absolutely. So you didn't let failure stop you. Absolutely. On that point, criticism, um, I've, I've never been one to really enjoy criticism. Like walking down a dark alley and somebody stabs me with a knife, I'm not going to go, right, give it to me again. <laughs> um, so criticism <laughs> sometimes feels bad, but here's what I do with it. I take criticism, and I, whether it's failing an exam or not doing well at some point, and I take it privately and I say, okay, great. What is my part in this, right? What, what could I have done or should I have done or might I have done differently? And I change it. And if it's something I can't change, I just, I'm okay with that. Um, you know. We need to talk after the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's something I can change, for example, not studying as well or not performing as well, I simply will make the adjustment. And uh, there's a little pride in there, you know, that has to get snapped down, and that's a daily occurrence for me. So it's a good, it's a good journey. Excellent. Uh, this is one kind of for a roundtable for everybody. Um, first off, uh, the question is, do you guys enjoy making the videos as much as you think the people do that love them? Obviously, we get those comments. I think I can answer that for everybody, but I'll let them do that. And then the, the follow-up question to that is, when you're making, say, a 14-hour series, how long does it typically take you to make a series that consists of 35 nuggets? I'll start with Garth. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes a while, at least for, for our stuff, for the, some of the Microsoft stuff, because we do demonstrations and lab materials, and, uh, and that's where most of the, the time comes in, is developing that, and then running through it, making sure it works, and, uh, and depending on how complex it is, when you're actually doing the night, and then something goes wrong, and then you realize, oh, you know, 20 minutes ago, I, <laughs> do it. I gotta go back and redo all that. So it, it really depends on the series and how much okay. uh, demo is involved. But uh, but generally, yeah, it, it takes thirty days, forty days, sixty days. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, again, I think yeah, we all get it. And I would say, uh, do you enjoy making those videos? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's it's a lot of fun. Excellent, Steve. Yeah, it it is a lot of fun making a video. It's it it's kind of you know just perks me up. Whether you know it's a first in the morning, it sets the day off, and it gives me the energy for the day. Or maybe you're picking it up halfway through the day, and it, it's a boost. It, it's, it's, you know, some people say exercise gives you more energy. Doing videos gives me more energy. It, it really is, is a pick-me-up. It's better than any coffee or energy drink you're ever going to find in the marketplace. How long it takes? It takes a long time. It takes long time to, to plot out the course, to, to plan the videos, to, to digest all of the material and organize it into a, an organized fashion. Then you have to plan each video, and then you have to record the video, and then you have to edit and proofread the video. You know, and it, it does take time. Whether it's live demos, or in my case, it's a lot of my de videos are, are more theory and, and whiteboarded, but it still takes a long time to put them together. It's it's it's, it's not thirty minutes and you're done. It's it's, it's hours and you're done. Definitely, and I, and I think just jump in real quick. I think one of the differences with CBT Nuggets is you know we plan, but we don't script. So to go to those points right away, things happen when we're making them. Um, you know, we're not trying to just do a canned presentation for you guys. We're trying to create a presentation 
and work it for each individual one on one, and that creates some opportunity for some things to go wrong. Yep. And that's okay, and that gives us that opportunity to revert, get it back together, and so that makes that process a little bit longer. And and I think you know, kind of touching what you said, Ryan, you know, especially with the uh, some of the office products that I've done, where uh, things that I do on an, on a regular everyday, you know, I'm typing, I'm doing, I'm using Excel, I'm doing these things. Uh, tend to be, you know, rather, um, you know, uh, mundane for certain people. But I get excited because I remember the first time that I uh, got at to work, where I, you know, it, it actually worked, which is always fun. Now, what makes it, <laughs> which also makes it interesting when you're recording, though, because obviously there's the, uh, you know, we can call them the ghosts in the machine, where for some odd reason, um, I thought I followed all the three or four steps you need to do to, you know, start this. And when you click OK and you want that aha moment and it just doesn't work, and uh, which is always fun and surprising. And then you, you know, guess what? It, it, you know, it makes me have to go think back and going, well, obviously, what I just taught somebody, it's wrong. I need to think, rethink it, make sure that I did the right thing. And so there are certain things that I think in any one of our videos where we just kind of have to say, guess what? I thought that was really the way that to go with this, but not so much, which is always exciting for me because then I learn not only... Uh, you know, I'm the kind of learner where I usually learn about four different wrong ways, wrong ways of doing things before I learn the right way. And once I learn the right way, I can then turn around going, hey, by the way, guys, those other ways, they're not so good. Can, can I jump in? I think that was your video, where, um, and I really liked it, where there was an issue that came up, and instead of just editing it out, which is easy to do, it's like, you know what? This is a, a thing that really comes up, yeah. and let me walk you through what I would do. You can watch over my shoulder as we would troubleshoot this. And that was, it was, I think it was yours, I was watching. Could be. It could have been uh, years ago, but it was fantastic. Um, so occasionally I, I'll do that too, I'll leave something in. I'll say, that. Nah, that's not exactly what I was expecting. <laughs> but but here, we'll troubleshoot it, so I appreciate keeping it real. And I drink coffee for energy but to do my nuggets. Yes. <laughs> I, I love making the videos. I've been doing, doing it for 11 years for CBT Nuggets, and if I didn't like it anymore, I wouldn't do it anymore. Uh, it's... You know, I'll, I'll be honest. Sometimes in the in the morning when I get started and I look at this long list of whiteboards that I've got to go through and the demos that I have to do and all that, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of work to do today. And uh, it's time for a nap. No, <laughs> uh, uh, but then I, for me, as long as I can discipline myself to just get hit the record button and start talking from that moment forward, I love what I'm doing. But when it's all in front of you, it seems like a lot. But when I get going, it's a blast. And I think one of the things that makes it very rewarding, too, is that I just love to know that we're making a difference in people's lives. People are getting certified. People are getting promoted. People are getting jobs, or at least getting a better marketability out there. And, you know, I get emails from people and comments from people all the time that say they, they passed the exam. They're so proud. They're so happy that they've been able to do it. Um, and that's very gratifying. You know, and I know these guys all agree with me. When you help somebody move ahead in their life, help their family, um, live the dream. I mean, you can't beat that. That's just, as far as how long it takes, <laughs> it's an embarrassingly long period of time, for me especially. I'm not as smart as anybody else in the room, so it takes me a, a little longer, uh, and I make a lot of dumb mistakes, and I uh, have to redo things, and uh, stuff blows up, and, and so on. So, you know, probably when you see the videos, you think, Oh man, these guys have got it made. They just go know how to go right right through all the steps. And they just fly through the stuff. Uh, you don't see all the mistakes or the the things we forgot to do, you know, <laughs> and uh, and have to go back and fix things. So it takes me an embarrassingly long period of time. Hey Tim, I'm gonna jump in <laughs> real quick before you answer mm -hmm. that. We just got one great question in there as we're getting close to the time, and I want to get right. your take on it. Um, what is your opinion on? Do you think the cloud will diminish the need for traditional server admins? Or is it just changing where the servers are physically located? Well, the latter is certainly true because the point of the cloud is off-premises infrastructure. Um, and some of the day-to-day -day server admin tasks, as I said earlier in this talk, you're offloading to your hosting provider. Maybe you're relying upon them for backups, for instance. But ultimately, you've still got to keep things going. <laughs> if you're hosting line of business applications, somebody's got to develop and maintain those for your employee population, your user base, and the services that they access, email, SharePoint portals, whatever. I'm not sure if I'd be comfortable myself trusting day-to-day -day admin. You'd be paying through the nose for it, wouldn't you, Garth? Oh, yeah. So 
So no, short answer, no. I don't think cloud is, is fully supplanting it, uh, the server admin. Perfect. I appreciate you jumping in on that. I just, just we are on time frame, I just wanted to get to a couple more questions. And Keith, we've got one for you um, that I thought was really interesting that I thought you would like to get on is, um, when do you think wireless field in Cisco will start spreading? Can't imagine offices without LAN cables. Right. Um, it's amazing right now how much of our networks are wireless. Uh, it's just so in a wireless room. Yeah, yeah, so convenient, yeah. and there's so many attack vectors with wireless. It's embarrassing. So uh, the prolifer the proliferation. It's easy for me to say. Of wireless is going to keep growing and growing and growing. They haven't got wireless power dial in yet. That's a little bit of a joke, but um, <laughs> wireless is so wireless is huge. It's a huge security risk, and um, the more you know about wireless, the better you'll be because every environment is going to have wireless. Do you see it some planning? I mean, do you see cables and all? I mean, like we're going to need some cables. Okay. Um, you know, for long haul and high throughput, you need fiber and you know copper delivering it to the point of presence. But uh, as far as laptops and devices, it's very likely that all the user machines will be wireless. I think in this office, probably most of our machines. Well, can't speak for this office; I don't manage it here. But most of the network devices that are new and added. Are going to be wireless because it's a mobile workforce. I mean, yeah. PCs are going away. We have tablets, we have PCs, oh, yeah. and they all, they're all wireless. Definitely. Now we get to our last question because we've got our, uh, our time limit here at uh, 12 noon. We just, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, taking the time uh, to be here. I think everyone has really enjoyed the questions that yeah. have come in. We've got a great um, social presence that's been bringing those to us, and we appreciate everybody tuning in and taking the time to ask the questions. Um, the one I'll end on, which I think is really good, and uh, James, I'll start with you is what would you say is the best way to gain experience and you consider home labs as experience? Absolutely. Home labs are experience. In a way, home labs are better experience because if you're, if you're in a job, you're locked into what they have and you can't experiment with, what if I were to reconfigure this this way sure. and then a thousand users are off the network? Um, but in, in a home lab, you have no limitations as to what you can learn and experiment with, and especially with things like uh, virtualization and snapshots. Uh, you know, you make a mistake, you just revert back, and 30 seconds later, you're fine. You know, uh, so you know you can't beat the real world for some things. And, and one of the which is working under pressure, because sometimes for IT people, man, when something goes down, it is live or die right there. You know, that's your whole life. <laughs> uh, but in the lab, oh, you got so much flexibility, and you can, and if you have a passion for it, you can learn so much. And Steve, what's your take on the project management side about gaining experience and? How do you how do you get that before you actually get in? And I know for PDUs and some different things in PMI. There, well, there, there's important. lots lots of user groups, lots of, of participation. But to me, how do you get experience project management? And I've I've often used this example in some of my my series. You do project management every day. You get up in the morning and you need to be in the office by 8 a.m. You have a plan. I'm going to shower. I'm going to walk the dog. I'm going to make the kids lunches. I'm going to do this. You hit the snooze button instead of getting up. You now have a project change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you begin to, so all of a sudden, instead of walking the dog, you put the dog outside and hope the dog tech catcher doesn't get them. Instead of making the kids lunch, you reach into your pocket, you hand them some money, but you're making changes. Sure. Everything we do is a project. So if you truly want to have a home lab, your kids may begin to hate you for it, but begin to treat your life as a, as a project and begin to apply project management principles to it. And Garth, what's your take on that? And Chris, we'll get to you. Too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, real world experience is good, but in your lab, hands on. Just do it. Just build stuff. Watch it happen. I'm a hands on learner too. You know, uh, reading and, and and watching people draw on whiteboards is great, and it needs to happen. But I think most of of what you learn is going to come from doing it. Sure. Definitely, I think too on the dev side. Um, I know we've done some different things with some of our team members. Is you know find a charity, or find some place that needs help at the website, yes. yeah. or find somewhere where you can get in. You exactly. Know, and Project management that. volunteers yeah. oh. volunteer uh, at your local yeah. group, and you take an event. You take whatever it is, and you say, "I'll run with it." That's a project to get to get your experience. You do not have to get paid to do project management. No. That's great. Well, again, uh, from everyone here at CBT Nuggets, uh, we really enjoy um, the opportunity to speak to everyone. Um, it's been a great experience. Uh, we'll be doing this again soon. And again, thank you very much for taking the time to watch. And thank you for taking the time to give your questions and put them in. So, All right. thanks, everybody. Cheers. Thanks thank a you. lot.